That's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Amen, sure is. Here, singing like that it makes me want to preach on the yeah, show. But we're not going to. Mark chapter number 14. Thanks for coming tonight. Amen. I'm sorry it's so hot in here. I realize that y'all are concerned about wintertime and stuff, but uh, you take the offering and pay for the electricity it takes to run the air conditioner. And... Uh, <laughs> Praise the Lord. Look at that, man. How about that, Brother Toby? The Holy Ghost just answered. <laughs> My goodness, man. Well, thank the Lord. It may just be me. Maybe I'm just nervous or maybe you all make me nervous, but I'm sitting there while they're singing. I'm already starting to break out in one of those. I think they call it a glow when you get older. <laughs> Where I come from, it's called sweat. You know, it's like, man, I'm just sitting here sweating. What am I doing? I, you know, I don't know what the deal is. So either you all made me nervous, I'm fixing to have a heart attack or a stroke, or... <laughs> Or it really is hot in here, right? You know, maybe that, that actually could be. I want to preach to you tonight a little bit, a real familiar story. As a matter of fact, the Lord said about this particular woman that wherever the gospel is preached, let the story be told about her. Well, I think the gospel has been preached in a lot of places, so I would imagine this story has been told a lot of times. But I'd like to maybe put a little different sort of a thought with uh, what's going on here tonight and try to do my best to show you some things about Mary uh, that many people don't make application for today. Generally speaking, until the late 1900s, I guess you could, uh, late 1800s, uh, women were pretty much, even in the United States of America, they were generally put down, they were put away, they were not uh, spoken of very highly, especially in the times of Jesus. Their value wasn't worth much more than an animal, most likely a dog. They were seen to be seen and not to be heard and they were individuals that were treated as servants or slaves and even if they were married, they were always in question. They didn't have their own careers, they didn't have their own standing, they didn't have their own name. I mean, no matter what happened, they were either had their father's name or they had their husband's name. Now things have progressed obviously since that time, but there still sort of is that lingering idea that generally speaking, that when it comes to a woman compared to a man, that for whatever reason, it doesn't ever seem to measure up. Yet in the Bible, you find sort of a strange thing that takes place. And before you throw stones at me, lady, I want you, ladies, you want to listen to me now. One of the things that's strange is, is that when the Lord chooses to draw attention to someone and make a memorial to them, it's a woman, not a man. A woman exhibits something that even the Old Testament prophets didn't exhibit. A woman exists, exhibits something that Old Testament preachers didn't exhibit. A woman exhibited such a great character in this story that the Lord said of all the people in the entire Bible that he could make a memorial to, he said, let it be to a woman. That should teach us as men something. We're not always the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. We're not all that in a bag of chips. Sometimes the woman, I realize women can overstep. I realize they can get out of place and get out of line. I understand what the Bible says about submission. I preached a message one time. It was supposed to be a kind of like a sweetheart banquet, and I was given three uh, messages, and one of the messages had to do with what women were to do and this and that and the other, and the other message was about what men were doing. The man came up after the message, and he said to me, he said, why don't you use Proverbs 31? There's good verses in there on women. And I said, you know, well, I said, brother, I don't know. I could use Proverbs 31. He said, well, that's the verse on the, the passage in the Bible about women. I said, okay, well, what do you do with all the other passages? I said, if they're not to women, then they must be to you. I think sometimes we're real quick to throw stones at other people, and yet here this woman is going to come into the story and literally break into the story. I mean literally breach a table that's going on there, a, a supper that's going on there. The guys are sitting around having a men's meeting, and this woman has the audacity to walk in, and the men sitting at the table get mad at her. And the Lord says, let her alone. She hath wrought a good work on me. She did something for me. I want you to look in the passage and I'm going to walk you through the story and I'll give you a, a couple of things about broken boxes. I think the thing that is in most imperative, in spite of all the steps we give you up here this morning, we had two hours of classes on that today, and there's some good things there that will help you if you choose to apply those things. But if you're not willing to break your box, none of that's going to happen. None of that's going to help you. 
If you're not willing to look at yourself and your own Christian life and to say and recognize, I'm not my own, I'm bought with a price, and Lord, I'm going to take what you gave me, the attributes, the skills, and all the things that I have, and I'm giving it all back to you, and I'm letting you take control of things. You realize when the prodigal left the house, of course, he thought the father's house was a prison. I've told you that before. Do you realize when he left that the father had to be the one to finance his trip to the pig pen? Where did he get the money for him? You say, well, it was his inheritance. Whose money had it been? Do you realize that if you choose to go out and serve the world, serve the flesh, serve yourself, or serve the devil, do you realize who's paying the bill? Who gave you your eyes? Who gave you your ears? Who gave you your sense of smell and your sense of taste where you can taste the good food in here? Who gave you the ability to speak? Who gave you the brains? Who gave you the ability to get up? I mean, if you choose to use it for the rest of the world, ladies and gentlemen, you're using what he financed. You have to go to him and say, Lord, I'm choosing to use what you gave me, but I want to use it on me. But he's the one that did it for you. He keeps your ticker going. Now, I appreciate the fact you got hospitals and I appreciate you got doctors. I appreciate the fact that when you have severe problems and things like that, that you can go to somebody and through medical science and things like that, they might be able to keep you going a little longer or make life a little more comfortable for you. I honestly do. I appreciate that. I really do. It means a lot. But I'd like to say this. If the Lord hadn't given them the ability to know those things, none of those things would be helping you. Man didn't come up with that. Jonah Salk's not sitting over there working around one day and he just happens up on penicillin and that kind of a thing. He going through the stuff and he begins to see chemical compounds and things begin to come together and then as they begin to get together and stuff like that, he develops a thing called penicillin and when penicillin comes out, it begins to kill off bacteria and stuff like that. How did he even know that stuff? I mean, he's at the advent of some certain scientists there biologically and thing. He's at the, at the beginning of some sciences that have nothing to do. Nobody's ever studied it before. Thomas Edison, what did he do? I guess you have to turn it down. They're getting out blankets now, so I'm sorry. I feel like a woman in menopause, man. <laughs> One minute you're burning up and dying, and the next minute you're freezing to death. I feel for you. I really do. I don't, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't wish that on anybody. That's got to be tough. You know, a guy goes out when he goes through, you know, when he goes through his years, he'll buy a red sports car or something, and, you know, he's got his big old gut hanging over his belt and things like that, but he thinks he's a chick magnet and all that. <laughs> But a woman lives with it 24 hours a day, man. I mean, one minute she's burning up and the sheet, she's all tangled up in them. And she can't wait to get her up. And then the next minute she's singing Frosty the Snowman. And you walk in the kitchen and you say, hey, babe, how are you doing? And she goes, who are you? You know, and you're thinking, I'll be back in about 20 minutes, you know. And it, it's just that way. I don't know why it's that way, but you're, you know, it's got to be difficult. I feel like that right now. I'm, I'm still, you can have my coat if you want to. I'm still sweating. Here's the thing you've got to recognize or understand. There's something in the Bible about brokenness that God likes. Amen. There's something in the Bible about God's way of looking at vessels that are broken. He likes that for some reason. He says to the apostles when he's having the last supper there, he's getting ready to break open the bread, and he breaks the bread, and he begins to distribute the bread. You know what he said? This is my body, which is, do you know it? Broken, broken for you. God likes broken things. Amen. God likes your life has been broken all to pieces and torn all to shreds and it's not worth anything whether anybody would want anything to do with it. And you bring that broken life to the Lord and you say to the Lord, Lord, I'm broken, I'm busted, I'm all to pieces, I'm tore up, I'm good for nothing, I'm rotten, I'm lower and whale poop in the bottom of the ocean. Nobody wants me, nobody wants nothing to do with me. I'm an outcast and the Lord said, good, I'll take you. Amen. I remember being in prison down in uh, Madison one time and my preacher was preaching on the crucifixion and he's preaching to a whole room full of women there, about 75 women in there. And he began to preach up there while he was preaching. He's preaching on the crucifixion and he said, now ladies, if you've ever been loved, boy, you want to be loved by a man like this. And he starts bragging on the attributes of Christ. And one of the black ladies in there, she said, I ain't never been loved that way. And he said, well, I can show you how to be loved. You meet this man right here and goes on. They talk back while you're preaching like that. And there's a lady sitting in the very, very back, in the back. And I mean, she's got skin poppers all over her man from putting needles in her. And she's got a, a, what I call meth teeth, popcorn teeth, burnt popcorn, about lost all the teeth in her head. I mean, she looked like something the cat drug in and had been run over several times before I ever drug it in. 
and she's sitting on that back row there and as he begins to talk about how good the Lord is and how he loves you and how he cares about you, I see them tears begin to come down. Boy, they're crashing down off her cheeks like mountain rain running off of a mountain after a spring rain, man. I mean, just splashing down there on the terrazzo floor in that place. That place smelled. They're going through all kind of detox and stuff. It smells like sweat and a mixture of alcohol and drugs and just foul, foul odors coming out of the place. And she's sitting back there. She's got on her orange jams and stuff like that, all of them dressed in orange and stuff like that. And he's preaching, and I'm thinking, boy, she's going she's gonna to get saved today. She's going to get saved today, you know. And I'm watching, and he's preaching, gets ready to give the invitation, he gives the invitation, and several of the girls profess uh, Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and all that. And I noticed her. She sat there and I watched her cry and her little lips just quivering like a little baby does, you know, sometimes just shaking, just trembling. And I thought, man, surely she's going to pray. No testimony, no nothing. She just sat there. And so all of a sudden, you know, the people are getting ready to go out. And I thought, well, I guess I missed that. Maybe she just, you know, doesn't, wouldn't want the invitation. And so I'm rolling up the picture to give it to the chaplain there, a real good chaplain name. Her name's Westmoreland. She's probably gone now. She was been there 30 years when we got there. Good female chaplain, Orange County Jail down in Orlando, not Madison. And I'm rolling up that picture. And I start rolling that thing up and I notice, just like you notice the lights here, I noticed a shadow kind of come up over the top of me there. And I turned around and looked and it's that girl. And she's standing there. She looked like a, maybe like a broom handle or something. She's about that big around and I mean life had just been hard on her. She's about 20 years old and looked like she's every bit of 50. I'm not stretching it. I'm not just giving you a preacher's illustration. I'm telling you, she, she had been through it. And I look down, she looks at the picture down there, and she says to me, she says, don't hurt him. And I said, I, I'm not going to hurt him. You can't hurt him. He's seated at the right hand of the Father and never liveth to make intercession for you, you know. And I'm rolling up the picture like that. And, and she said, well, he can't clean me up. And I said, Sister, that Bible says, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as snow. I said, If he can clean me and clean you. She said, You don't know what I did. I said, I don't need to know what you did. She said, I'm way too dirty. She never even stopped. She never even took a breath. I'm way too dirty. You don't know what I've done. You don't know the horrible things that I've done. I said, I don't need to know what they are. I know that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin, and if it cleanses from all sin, that means whatever you've done, he'll put it aside. As far as the east is from the west, he'll bury it behind his back. He'll bury it in the depths of the sea. It's over and it's done with. And she said, uh, I just don't believe he can clean me. And I said, well, why don't you try it? She sat down on the pew right there. And I finished rolling up the picture, and I got it. I called Chaplain Westmoreland, and she came over. And she began to deal with her. And after a little while, man, those tears started back again. And an old snot coming out of her nose, you know. And she's, she's giving it that sort of a in-between, you know, catching those short breaths and stuff. And then directly I saw her kind of ease off of the pew. And she's over there. And chaplain's down here praying. And next thing I know, then the correction officer comes in the back of the building there and looking for her because she's not back where she's supposed to be. And she hollers, and the chaplain gives her the thing, and then the lady hollers again, real loud, real just, you know, get, get in here, count, it's time for count, you know. And so the girl got up, she knew she was in trouble, and she started out down the way over there, and I'm still over here in the corner. And I said, hey, I said, uh, sister, are you doing okay? And she turned and looked at me. I'll never forget it. She turned and looked at me. She still had popcorn teeth, you know, and she still had the skin poppers, and she still had old straw, scraggly-looking hair, looked like a scarecrow or something. And she turned to me, but there was something different. Amen. And there was just something about her countenance. Amen. And I said, did you get anything settled? And she said, I'm clean Amen. now. I'm clean Amen. now. I'm clean now. Amen. She still went back to her jail cell. She still had to pay for whatever it is she did. I never even looked it up. I never wanted to know. But you know what I know? From that moment forward, she was clean. Amen. But you know what she did? She came to the Lord broken. You know what people think? They think they've got to get their life in order before they can come to the Lord. No, he's about fixing broken Amen. people, people that don't have eyes and people that can't speak and people that have leprosy and people that have all manner of diseases, including death. They come to the Lord. Nobody else wants them. The Lord said, I'll take you. Amen. You ever look at the devil-possessed man of gathering? I'm going to get to this in just a second Amen. here. But uh, you ever see about the devil-possessed man of gathering? That's a strange story in the Bible. Mark chapter 4, they're out there on the ship and the ship blowing around in the storm. The apostles have no idea why the storm's going on. The Lord's in the boat with them. They're thinking, man, you've got to be kidding me. Another storm and the Lord's in the boat. Why, if the Lord's in the boat with us, we shouldn't be having any storms like that. And the Lord, of all things, is sound asleep. 
in the middle of the storm. He's not worried about it at all. You know why? He knows the purpose of the storm. Amen. He knows the storm is carrying them to a place they wouldn't normally go. There's nobody in their right mind that would paddle over to the island of Gadarene and deal with a devil-possessed man. And the Lord's over there going, boys, y'all are in for a ride, man. Ain't this going to be a hoot, man? And he says, y'all wake me up when we hit the beach, you know, and that kind of thing. He goes to sleep and they wake up. Lord, you carried us we perish? And that ship's out there and all the other little ships. Guess who's sitting up there on the precipice over there looking over that sea? There's that demon-possessed man up there and he's watching them and laughing and howling and growling. Naked as the day he was born, man. He's got an old scraggly beard and stuff up there and he's still got the chains where he's broken them off of him, the fetters off of his feet and things. And he's just sitting up there crouching like a gargoyle up on one of those old architectural buildings and looking over there with a grimace on his face, man, that make you think there's something evil, something wicked that's going on there. He can't wait to see their bodies wash up on the beach. He knows how the currents are going to carry him. And then all of a sudden he sees somebody through the lightning flash up there. He sees all of a sudden somebody stand up on the front of that boat and he thinks man what a fool man the wave's going to knock him off the boat and he'll be going swimming here before long and he hears an echo out there of a noise and it's, he recognizes it as a voice that carries above the thunder and above the wind and above the lightning and it says peace be still in the Greek that shut up I'm trying to sleep and all of a sudden boy I mean that water I'm talking like that that water laid down boy and it was just as smooth as a satin sheet man and all of a sudden that moon popped out there and that light began to dance out across that water and the chandeliers of heaven began to come on one at a time as the clouds got blown out of the way and it's just as still as it could possibly be out there and the Lord looks at him and he says how's that boys <laughs> now uh, let's go ahead and roll on over here to the beach and if you listen you can hear the sound of those orders or slapping that water just Slapping that water. Not a wisp of wind anymore for anything. Sails down. They bailed out the water. Everything's fine. I think that devil-possessed man said, Man, I sure wish he could do in here what he just did out there. You say, Why? He's devil-possessed. Well, here's the odd thing about the Lord when they pull up there on the beach at Gadarene. If I could paint, I'd paint a picture. I'd paint some of the strangest pictures you've ever seen in your life. I'd have the Lord get out and walk through the water there and step up on the beach as soon as the gunnels or the, the bow of that boat slid up there on the keel of that boat slid up on that rocky beach. I'd have the Lord walk up there, have him get out of it there, and the apostles are starting to get out and secure everything in the boat and get ready to pull it up onto the beach a little bit so it doesn't drift off and that kind of a thing. And I'd have coming through the bushes like a crazy man, a wild man, I'd have that devil possessed man come running at the Lord and I'd have, I'd have you know big fisherman Peter, no offense brother Toby I'd have big fisherman Peter I'd have Peter, he's getting out of the boat and then I'd have him kind of leaning back in the boat like I think I don't want to get out right now, I'd have John and all the Matthew, the rest of them, they're kind of thinking you know I think we'll just get back in the boat and they're already grabbing an oar you know thinking we need to just go ahead and push off I'd have the Lord standing right there and I'd have him say, what you want? And I'd have that guy run right up to him. And for the first time, that guy ran up to him. He met somebody that wasn't afraid of him. And he wasn't ashamed of him. And he wasn't embarrassed by him. And he ran up there and he said, man, I got problems. I got real problems. I got all kind of trouble, man. I mean, I got so many problems. Carter ain't got enough pills to fix them all. I've been to see everybody there is to see. I've been to every doctor there is to be. I've been put in chains. I've been put in prison. I've been gone through every program you can possibly imagine. And the Lord said, why don't you try me? And he said, what would you want to do with somebody like me? Can you do in my head what you just did out there? And the Lord said, I can if you're willing. I'd have him be just as calm and cool as a cucumber looking at that man eyeball to eyeball and then the Lord say something to him. Don't you think it's interesting how the Lord deals with that stuff? You know what the Lord says to him? He said, what's your name? I like that personal touch. What's your name? You know, you get over there when the Lord comes into the, they run into the tomb over there, remember, and they... They're scared and afraid of what's going on and that kind of thing. And then the Lord's standing there in the garden as they, they think it's a gardener. You know what he does? Mary's all diswrought. She's tore out of the frame. She's all messed up and all. That's Mary Magdalene there. You know what the Lord does? He says, Mary. Ain't that cool? He's up there in the room of the upper room and stuff. And, you know, Thomas is the one that denied him and all that kind of deal. And, you know, said he wasn't here. And I don't really believe it unless I put my finger. You know what he called? He says, hey, Thomas. 
You know what's good about that is, is that Thomas doubted him, right? But you know what he did? He came down there and he said, Thomas. You know what he says to uh, Peter over on the beach? He said, Peter, do you love me? I like the personal touch of the Amen. Lord. I promise you I'm going to get in the sermon here in just a minute. I just, I just, I just, I just like the fact that God, he's, he's not a trash collector, Amen. but he's a great recycler. Amen. There's nobody in here, there's nobody in here that God hadn't had to recycle. And you get to thinking a little too highly of yourself sometimes and you get to running around because all of a sudden you're all cleaned up and spiffed up and shined up and all that kind of a thing. You'd almost think your keeping of the law got you where you are. The only reason you're not running around and depends in an psych ward somewhere is because of what God did for you. It had nothing to do with you. It had nothing to do with your church attendance and how much you read the Bible and how much you submitted to the Lord and all that. That's God's grace that did that. Don't take that away. You say, what happened? He took you when you weren't even taken. You know what he'll do? He'll even take a Pharisee. I like when he deals with Nicodemus. He calls him by name. You know what he does with that woman there? He says to her, Mary. He says to that man, he says, what's your name? He said, uh, my name's Legion, for we are many. And the Lord said, well, I'm going to fix that. You've got multiple personality disorder. <laughs> I'm going to get it taken care of. That's the first case of hogicide in the Bible, suicide. And the pigs run off into the, that's a good yeah. story. Yeah. Deviled ham, how's that one? Yeah. That'll, that'll, will that one make you laugh? <laughs> okay, deviled ham. And they run off the ridge over there. And you know what you find? You find that boy, the Lord doesn't say, follow me. The, boy doesn't, the Lord doesn't say, this is what you need to do. The Lord doesn't say, you know what he does? He comes up there and he does what he does for that young man and cast out the demons. And you read on down in the passage on Old Schofield, the right-hand page, the left-hand column. You get down there about halfway, you know what it says? And he was seated and clothed and in his right mind. Nobody had to force him. I like, I like the woman over there at the well. I've told you the story about her before. What I like about her is, is the Lord never said, go tell other people. You realize how bold she was? I like the women in the Bible. You realize how bold she was? She's willing to go back into town where everybody knows her as a homewrecker. Everybody knows her as sleeping around. Everybody knows how she's the bottom of the barrel, folks. Everybody knows who she is. She is the talk of the town. And she comes in, and it's interesting. You know what her testimony is? Come see a man that told me everything I ever did. Amen. And he still did something for me. Amen. Even though I was a train wreck, and I was sorry, and I was good for nothing. You know what I know? I think that's somebody that appreciates what God did for him. My, my wife has that tendency. My wife tends to be that way, and the fact that she'll... She will get overly bold at times, sometimes to the point of embarrassment. She'll talk to everybody, anybody. She's going to get a gospel witness in there somewhere. She's more bold than I am. She's bold as a stinking lion. We were getting on a plane one time, and I'm looking, and she takes tracks, and she'll hand them to people, but then she puts them back in the day before all the virus stuff. She put them in the magazines in there, you know. And so she's got that one that Chick has out, that Flight 741 or whatever that crashes. <laughs> It's right after the time of the towers came down and all that. I'm like, babe, you can't be doing that. She goes, doing what? And I said, honey, that's about a plane crash. You, they'll think you're a terrorist. She goes, out loud in the plane. You, they think I'm going to blow up the plane. I said, babe, don't stop. Don't do that. She goes, what? What's the problem? Man, I, listen, always for a long time we're sitting in the back part. There's three seats. I'm giving her the middle seat. You say, why? Because she's going to be talking over me to whoever I'm sitting by because somewhere along the line, that's just how she is. She's just, she loves what she does. I'm grateful that I have a woman that loves to serve the Lord. A lot of people are like, oh, well, your wife wants to do this and she wants to do that. Well, she ain't nobody else going to do it. She ain't doing it because nobody else does it. She loves doing it. Amen. She's been doing it with me now. Think about it. She's been doing it with me now for 31 years as a pastor's Amen. wife. And she loves it. Amen. I mean, I get on the phone with her in the morning and, hey, how are you this morning? And then she's immediately in business mode. Well, I've got this going, i got this going, I've got this going, i got this going. And I'm thinking, could you just say, hey, babe, I love you and I miss you? Or <laughs> can I get a cup of coffee before you get started or whatever? I'm not leaving all y'all out. They just seem more friendly over here, so I don't <laughs> Look, if you will, please, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get myself in trouble. We'll be way too late here. Look, if you will, please, in Mark 14, and let me just give you a couple of things. Now, verse number 3, And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, and he sat at meat, and there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, 
And she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of ointment made? Now this isn't the same woman that came in uh, with the Pharisee's house. That was a different woman. This is a different Mary. I'll give you all that stuff a little another time or your pastor can if you hadn't already. For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor and they murmured against her. And Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. She made him look good, not just something for herself. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, you may do them good. But me ye have not always. Notice there's a time frame. She has an opportunity to do something, but it's only for a period of time. Listen, God sometimes will call you to do something and give you an opportunity to answer it, but you know what He's doing? He's walking on. Will you follow me? Lord, I'll follow you. Okay, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, son of man has nowhere to lay his head. You mean I won't have any holdings, any house, any real estate? That's what I mean. Okay, Lord, see you later. What does the Lord do? He keeps walking. He keeps moving. Lord, I'll follow you. Okay, good. You want to go ahead and follow me? Come on, follow me. Let's go preach. Well, I got to go bury my dead. Let the dad be, let the dead bury the dead. Let the dead bury the dead. But Lord, that's my dad. Were you from the south or something? Don't worry about it. You got a chance right now to preach with me. Come on, let's go. But Lord, I can't. I, I got a I got a connection to my family. Whoso lover, mother, father, sister, brother, husband, wife, children, yea, his own life also, can't be my disciple. Didn't say you can't be saved. It's a choice. The Lord said, come on, let's go. But Lord, I mean, what about my family? I'm from the south, you know, the matriarchal system where mama runs everything. And, and if I don't run everything, you know, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm from a patriarchal family and, and you know, i got to do whatever Diddy says. That's how they say it in the south. And where I'm from up there, it ain't daddy, it's Diddy. D-I-D-D-Y. And you got a control freak for a patriarch or a control freak for a matriarch. And the Lord said, come on and follow me. Oh, Lord, I, I, let me go check with them. Well, you ain't coming back if you go check with them. They're going to talk you out of it. See you later. Lord, I'll follow you. I'll be glad to follow you. Sure, man, I'm right behind you. No question about it. I get to follow Jesus. Sure, okay, good. Lord, if you would, but let me run first over here, if I could, please, and to check with the friends back at my house. You, know, you get past the Super Bowl party, everything's going to be fine. I don't care if you watch the Super Bowl. TiVo it, and when you all get out of church on Sunday, go home and enjoy yourself. Eat a nacho for me or whatever you have. But here's the thing that you have to recognize. You know what he said to him? He said, let me go back first. You know what he knows? He knows if he goes back and checks with his friends, you know what? He ain't going to do what God says to do. You say, why? It's not one of these kind of situations where it becomes a community decision. It's a personal decision. Sometimes it means you have to break from people you really love because they're not going the direction Jesus is going. Amen. Not because they're not going the direction you're going. Amen. They're not going the direction Jesus is going. Amen. And so you know what you have to do? Sometimes it's hard, it's hurtful, it's painful. I mean, I, I guarantee you, it ain't fun. It costs you. They try to talk you out of it. Well, I think I know what's best for you. Well, at some point, you better learn this about the Christian life. Some of you look like I just... Slap the smile off your face or something. You just all of a sudden, everything just kind of... Mm. There's a cost associated. If you're going to follow Jesus Christ, there's a cross involved. And that means, not my will, but thine be done. And the Lord has a way of causing you to jettison things in your life that get between you and Him. And you don't want to do that? That's fine. He's not going to force you. But He says, if you will, come on. He said, no, Lord, I... Well, if a man will, Lord, I'd like to. I'd like for you to come to supper. Okay, good. Lord, sign me up. I'll come. Okay, supper's ready. Come on. Well, Lord, I'd, 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 I'd like to come, you know, but I, I, I bought a piece of property and I need to go look at it. You mean you bought it without seeing it? Well, yeah, Lord, I mean, you know, just about any real estate's good nowadays. The market's high and sky high and it's going really, really good. I don't need to see it, man, because even if I don't get it, I can sell it and this and that and the other, but I'm going to go over there and check it out. Yeah, but you got a chance to come sit down and eat with me. Lord, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't come. I know I told you I'd come. I know I, know I told you I'd come. I, I mean, I, I took the invitation. And the Lord says, okay, well, whatever you want to do. Goes, hey, fellas, okay, let's go, man. Dinner's ready. Supper's ready. He comes in and he says, okay, supper's ready. He goes, well, Lord, I'd like to come, but I, I bought some yoke of oxen. And I need to go try them out. Well, if you know anything about animals that plow, whether they're horses or whether they're donkeys or whether they're oxen, you better try them before you buy them. 
You better look at the wear marks on the collar that they've been wearing. You better look at the wear marks on their shoulders because you'll find out whether you've got a good team or a bad team because they pull against each other and they can't get in the yoke and pull with anything else. They're always trying to pull the other one aside. That means you had you got a bad team of oxen there. I must need to go try them. You mean you bought them before you tried them? And trying those oxen are better than you sitting down with Jesus? Well, it's what the story says. Oh, well, preacher, it don't really happen that way. He comes to the last guy. He said, Lord, I know I told you I'd come to supper. He said, okay, well, it's a plus one. Go ahead and bring your wife with you and that kind of a thing. Well, Lord, I'm married now. Okay, good. Bring her with you. Well, Lord, I'd like to, but she don't want to go. Well, you told me you'd go. Why don't you come to supper? Well, things have changed. Oh, you mean she's now God in your life. The only thing changed is, Lord, I married a wife. You mean to tell me you said you'd come eat with me and now you're married? Well, look, you don't have to be a police detective for years and years and years to see where the problem is there. He married a wife. His wife won't let him go eat with Jesus. I got guys, they tell me up and down, they swear, they promise on, you know, I promise on my mother's eyes, you know, I've been called to preach. And then they meet a girl, and the next thing you know, you can't find them with a halogen flashlight. So what happened to you? You know, you finally run into them and all that. Well, preacher, you know how it is, you know, I, I got married, you know. <laughs> okay, you said you're called to preach. You in Bible school now? What, what are you doing? Well, I, I must have misread tea leaves, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know how it is, preacher. No, I don't. No, I don't know how that is. That's not how it's supposed to be. You got a spiritual backbone like a saw log or a cotton string, one or the other. And every time she huffs and puffs and blows your house down, it's like, okay, honey, it's time to go. You probably have to ask her if it's okay for you to go to the altar. She wouldn't want you upstaging her. Or if you go to the altar, you know what that woman will think? That woman will think, you know, well, you're going to the altar and people will think you're going down there to pray about me and there's something wrong with me, so you ain't going to the altar. Or, buddy, you'll be sleeping on the couch when you get to the house. You say, surely that doesn't come into the church. <laughs> you're smoking crack if you don't think that comes into church. You say, why? The church is made of people. That Bible is so up to date it ain't even funny, man. I mean, it's literally spot on. Uh, people always talk about the women, the women, the women, the women, the women. What about the stinking men? Amen. Majority of churches nowadays are full of women because they got more character than men do. The Lord must have known that. That's why he gave you a story like this. This woman's box was broken. What she chose to do was to do whatever the Lord said for her to do. I've told you the story before about a man named Herbie. Herbie was knock-knowed and pigeon-toed and uh, he knock-kneed and pigeon-toed and he went all around and sold his newspapers over at the paper company and would give that money because of the Lord and I mean twisted up like a pretzel, man and messed up as a soup sandwich and would sit on that second row right there and sing every song in the same key in the same way and irritate people and he was dirty and he was filthy and he stunk and he looked like he had socks on his teeth but you know what he never missed a church service Amen. unless he was very 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 sick he was sitting there I had a little altercation with him out there one day because he tried to hug me and told me he loved me because I was the preacher boy and he tried to hug me, man, and I said, man, get off of me, you stink, you know, I was about nine. And the hand of God came down and got me by the seat of the britches and I touched about every other three or four feet on there and went into a special room. In those days they didn't have a cry room, but it was a cry room that day. <laughs> and I went in there and I heard that familiar <laughs> come out of my dad's, you know, britches and I heard he said, boy... He said, that's Mr. Herbie to you, and I wish you had a hundred of them. And had me bend over a chair in there and gave me three swats, and he said, dry it up, and you go out there and apologize to Mr. Herbie. I went out there, and I looked at Mr. Herbie, man, and I can see him to this day, hair all disheveled, and his teeth all grainy looking and things like that, and standing there like this and shaking while I'm trying to talk to him and all that, and looked down there at me and like that, and I said, Mr. Herbie, I'm really sorry for saying what I said about you. You know what he said to me? That's all white. Uh, Herbie, love you. <laughs> man, I mean, that thing stuck me like a stinking knife right in my heart. You know what my daddy said? My daddy said, I wish I had a hundred of those people. You say, why? A broken box. 
I remember an old woman back in the back corner. Her name was Miss Lovelady up there in Chattanooga, Tennessee. My dad's pastor, big church up there. Big old sprawling building like this. Big balcony up there running television shows and stuff. Boy, I mean, he was a big dog. And this woman gets up during the service. Dad was up there. He's already preaching and stuff. And she gets up. She sounded like two styrofoam lids uh, cranking together. She had skin draped across her bones. that if she stuck her arm out the window, the skin would have beat her to death, man. <laughs> She would have sounded like one of those things, you know, you used to take playing cards and put them in your bicycle spokes and that thing go like that. I mean, it was bad. And here she come down there. She's 90-something years of age. She's bent over and humped over and can't hardly walk. Arthritis was all in her. And she's singing the song, I am satisfied. I am satisfied. But she's singing it like you're letting helium out of a, of a balloon, you know. I mean, it was like, man, somebody is rubbing. I'm, I'm a kid, man. Forgive me. That's what I was thinking. I'm a kid. I'm like, man, somebody get her. She's escaped the nut house. What is wrong with her? And I remember she got about halfway down that aisle on that side over there, and, and two big old deacons got up, and they were going to get her and do it. I mean, my dad hit that pulpit, man. Glass went flying all over the creation, man. It's a regular wooden pulpit, but it had lights on either side to help with the lighting and stuff like that. And he hit that pulpit, man, and that glass, which I did think that was pretty cool, you know. <laughs> the glass went flying. I was like, yeah, now he's preaching, you know, that kind of a thing. And my dad said, let her alone. It'd be good if some of you people got some of what she got. Amen. Boy, she come all the way down that aisle right there. She got there to the start, and she turned just like she was doing a military parade for the Tomb of the Unknown Shoulder. She comes across the front singing the same verse, singing the same hymn, singing the chorus of the thing, same verse, same hymn, same chorus, all the way across there, back to that side, back up that. My dad just went back and sat down over in the chair, waited for her to get done. And then he got back up and picked up. Where You see, what is that? That's a broken box. That's a broken box. There's a value in that broken box. You see what she's doing? She's letting the ointment out. Amen. You know, when this woman, when she came to the Lord, you know what happened? The alabaster is real hard. It's like marble. It's almost to the tinsel strength of granite. It's not an easy box to be broken. If we make that comparison to our flesh, to our willingness to submit ourselves, our wills, it's kind of like that. It's like granite. It's like case-hardened steel and those kind of things. It's a difficult box to break. That's why they put very valuable things in there. It wasn't going to just break. If you, it's not like an eggshell, like they make it out to be, oh, she just, no, it took effort to break it. You know what she did? She came up there like any good Baptist would do. She took the lid off that thing. She poured out 10%. She looked at it. She get, Okay, there's 10. Well, maybe give you 10 and a half. And she put the rest up. It was for her. No, that's a, one of those weird Bibles, one of those pink Bibles that says that. No, she broke the box. She gave him everything. You know what she did? She completely lost control of the substance on the inside. You do understand that that money that was there, the 300 pence, that was her retirement fund. That would keep her, if something happened to Lazarus, from having to be sold or used by a man in those days. And that would prevent her. She could continue to live until she became very old. That's what she had been putting up for a long time. That protected her from being put into somebody else's because she was just a woman and therefore she would have to be a cook or she would have to be somebody else's concubine or whatever it might be. And you know what she did? Of all the things she could give, she went up there, she took what she had been having as her security and she grabbed that off the shelf. And you know what she said? Shoot, man, I'm not relying on me anymore. I'm relying on him, and I'm not going to have him forever. I'm not going to wait till he's dead to do this. I'm going to do something for him right now. And I want you to understand that when the doors opened in the back, the reason that they were indignant, some had indignation, they were mad about it, was because when they saw her walk in, she didn't have any cookies or cake or iced tea and coffee on the tray for them. Because the custom would be that the woman came in to serve the men no other reason. And when they saw her that they didn't have anything for them, they're mad about it, and they're also mad because it's like, yeah, here comes Mary again, upstage in the meeting, always at Jesus' feet. Now she's got to come walking in here. Doesn't she know this is a men's meeting? Doesn't she know that we're talking real, real great things? I wonder what they're talking about at the table. I mean, I don't know. Judas is probably trying to figure out how much things cost and where the money's going to be going and that kind of a deal. It's in the passage, it looks that way. Uh, Matthew's probably trying to figure out, boy, when I was a tax collector, I could, you couldn't write this meal off. It's certainly not the ministry. And Peter would be telling his story of walking on water. You know he would be. <laughs> Y'all boys remember we were out there in that storm that time? when I, Yeah, Peter, we remember the story of you being out there. And, well, you remember, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, you know, I did sink. Yeah, Peter, we know the story, Peter. We understand 
say, oh, I just was just reminding you, no, praise Jesus, I was walking on the water. Any of y'all ever walked on the water before? You know, it would have been something like that. I guarantee you it wasn't where Cain get his wife. I guarantee you they weren't asking, Lord, how can we be better servants? I, I guarantee you there was some carnal discussion going on, and then in comes Mary, and it's like, oh, my Lord, what is she in here for? Something spiritual? And then they look up, and she's got this little box in her hands. And she's walking toward the Lord and they're like, well, there ain't nothing in it for us. And then Judas probably thinks, oh, I know what it is. She's going to give an offering so we can take care of poor people and I'll have more money in the coffers and since I hold the bag, I'll be in control of that. Go ahead and bring it on down here, Mary. Put it in the offering plate and, and be gone now and get on out of here. And she walks up there, man, and I don't know what she hits it on, but I'm sure she doesn't break it with her hands. But she hits that thing, and when she does, she pours that entire thing over the top of the Lord, and she says, Lord, I know I've just changed the atmosphere. Martha's standing at the back of the door. This is my, my story, I tell it. Martha's at the back of the door. She's got flour all over her face, and she's shoving her glasses up there on her nose like this, and she's looking down there. And now all of a sudden, her biscuits and the pecan pie and the key lime pie and all the stuff she's been cooking, the chocolate cake and the fried chicken and fried fish and all the stuff that's been just making the place just a, like a big giant restaurant in there. It's all of a sudden smells like perfume. And she looks at her sister and goes, I'm leaving the dishes in the sink for you. It's about time you did something around here. Now that you've changed the aroma of the room, nobody's going to want dessert after that, you know. And I'd have Martha storming off. It doesn't say it happened that way, but I just kind of like to add realism to the story, you know. And breaks that box open and the men begin to murmur against her. And the Lord sort of sits up and he gets that stern look on his face. And he says, let her alone. He says, between the lines, you boys could learn something from this woman. You all think we're here to be sitting here eating. She knows time's getting close for me to be gone and time for her to do something for me is running out. And so you know what she's willing to do? Here's the part you want to get in the story. She just did what she could do. Amen. Boy, she's not near as talented as you. She ain't one of the twelve. She's not an apostle. She can't be. She's not a preacher. She's not a pastor. She can't be. Boy, she sure is preaching, ain't she? Look at her. She comes down there and she has to overcome their dirty looks. She has to overcome their comments. She has to overcome the atmosphere that's in. You say, why? She wanted to get to Jesus. I think her and the woman with the issue of blood had a lot of things in common. She just wanted to get to Jesus. If I could just get to Jesus, I can get my problem fixed. I can just get to Jesus. I can, I can get to Jesus. I know he won't treat me the way these fellows are treating me. Well, that woman comes in there and breaks that box open and the Lord sends a message to us all the way down here in 2022. You know what he said? Why can't you be like Mary? Why can't you just do what you can? Why can't you just be an encouragement? Why can't you just be a help? Why can't you just, wherever you can jump in to serve and help or to do something when you have the chance to do it, why can't you do that? Well, Lord, I'd like to, but I have, I have too many other things to do, too many other places to be, and too many things that I have to do. I remember a, a story of a lady up there when we were in Tennessee, the same church where my dad was or where Herbie was, Miss Lovelady was. There was a woman that was up there years ago. That woman was a lady uh, that uh, had crutches, and she had in those days uh, polio and stuff was around, and the crutches would come to your elbows, you know, and then had these little handlebars on them. And I can remember seeing that, that lady, and she would, you know, walk around like this. And you're a young kid. You look at stuff like that, and it's odd to you, and it makes you uncomfortable, and, 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 and you're kind of uneasy with that kind of a thing. And, and so you'd see people like that. You tended to stay away from them because you didn't understand what it was going on. You knew you shouldn't say anything, but you kind of thought, man, that's, you know, what's going on? And they said she had had polio and whatever, which I didn't know what all that was. You just thought, man, she's, she's crippled up. Man, it's terrible. She was in church all the time. And them crutches would be leaning up against the pew and they'd fall over in the middle of the service and stuff like that. And, and I don't know, there's just always a racket. And one day my dad was back there working and uh, he was at the church there and he kept hearing noises in the sanctuary. And so he thought, well, maybe the Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Ed was the janitor in those days. Mr. Ed was a, had one side twisted up like that, and he limped. He got messed up real bad in an accident. Mr. Ed was a janitor. He polished the floors over there with that floor polisher. He did that with one hand. He let me do that one time, man. That's the ride of my life. I never would forget it. He said, you want to try it? I said, yes, sir, I can handle that. You know, he said, well, you got to hold on tight, you know. And 
I put the thing down like that. And I mashed that handle. And man, I mean, I went flying. I twisted that cord up every which way. I didn't have enough sense to just let go of the handle, right? I held on tighter, right? It's like you're behind a ski boat. And they, you know, they tell you, know, you, you, you fall and you're out of the skis now. Turn loose of the rope. And then they drive, you know, to, they drag you till you drown, you know. And then when you finally float back up to the surface, it's like, turn loose. Well, all I had to do was turn it loose. He's hollering at me and he's trying to get over there to me, you know. I'm spinning all over everything like this, man. I look like Disco Duck out there, man. I'm flying all over the creation and he finally gets my hand off of it and it stops and I fall on the floor and I'm, I'm like this and he says, I think that's enough. I think that's enough, you know. My dad came in and he looked at that machine and he looked at Mr. Ed and then he looked at me and he said, okay, y'all are doing all right. I'll see you later on. He heard a noise in there. He thought maybe Mr. Ed was in there and he couldn't find it. And then he thought, well, maybe there's an animal or something in here. And he kept walking around. He walked down that aisle, he said, on the outside there. And he didn't see anything. He came over to the middle, crossed the back, and came down to one of the center aisles there, big center aisles on either side. And he got in there. And all of a sudden, he looked. And laying down underneath the pew, this lady's there. And the lady's laying on her back looking up. And my dad said, Miss uh, So-and-so, uh, what, what, what are you doing? And she, he said she kind of smiled and she held up a putty knife in one hand and a mason jar in the other hand. She says, well, preacher, she said, Mr. Ed said it was okay. And he said, well, okay, well, what are you doing? He, she said, well, I'm scraping the chewing gum off the pews from underneath the pews. Chink. Chink. She said, I start up this side, and then I come down this side, and then I go back up this side. She said, I can't get it all done in a day, preacher. She said, but I, I try to come at least once a week and come. Mr. Ed lets me in, and I come in. And you know what she did? She'd put those crutches down at the front. She'd lay down on her back, and she'd scunch underneath there and hit every pew in that place. You say, what is that? A broken box? Somebody that wants to do something. Nobody would know about it. Nobody will see it. Honest to God, with all my heart, I believe when I get the judgment seat of Christ, I'll be up there and the Lord will say, you're going to be behind that lady right there. Lord, did she preach a sermon? No. she sing a song? No. What'd she do? What she could. Everything she had, she gave it. You know, one of the oddest things in the Bible to me, one of the oddest things in the Bible, the Lord's getting ready to leave. He's getting ready to go up to have the Last Supper, and then he's going to go across the Brook Kidron, go up there to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to have the, the Gethsemane experience, not my will, but thine be done. And then he's going to come out of that thing there and go up to Calvary and die in the resurrection and all that. You know what? The last message that the Lord is preaching, he goes into the temple right before all that transpires and takes place, and he's not saying anything. You know all he's doing? He's watching people. How they're putting money in the plate. Isn't that odd to you? What a strange thing. I mean, you look it up. You read it. You're, you're watching. You know what's going on? He's sitting there, and he's just, he's just standing in the corner. And he's just looking, and here comes a woman. She's got two mites, and she walks over. She throws the two mites in the plate, and she walks off, and the Lord says to the boys, that woman gave more than everybody, and they're like, man, that other fellow threw a wad of bills in there choke a horse, man. you got to be kidding, man. I mean, what do you mean she gave more? And the Lord said, boys, y'all have a different way of looking at it than I do. She gave everything she had. Isn't that a weird story to end unless you see the connection? The Lord's fixing to give everything he's got. With a broken body, which is broken for you. No wonder he liked Mary. He, Mary got it. He said, I'm the alabaster box and the ointment's fixing to come out and that ointment is blood and it is going to give you forgiveness for everything. Does that touch your heart at all? I think in my lifetime of many people that have had broken boxes, I think about my dad even because he gave up what he did as far as his uh, career and that kind of a thing to serve the Lord and I know that he's glad that he did. I think about people that are out there that have uh, serve the Lord and been known to serve the Lord. I remember coming in from a, a midnight shift one time and I turned on the TV while I was getting ready to take a nap and I heard a fellow on the television and he was talking really, really funny and I thought, man, I know that voice from somewhere. I've heard that voice. I, I know that voice. I'm sure I know that voice. And I went back in there 
and there's a guy up there in this big old church, big orchestra up here, big choir, robed choir up here, big fancy church, man. Must have been 10,000 people in that place at least. And they're all up there, and they're singing and stuff, and he's up there, and he's leading the music, and he's all twisted up, man. I mean, he's, just, he's, he's moving around. He's doing all kind of funny stuff, half holding on to the pulpit and stuff like that, and he's slobbering all over the pulpit and spitting all over things, and then all of a sudden, you know, he stops. He says, stop, stop. I got cerebral palsy. What's your problem? I thought, my, he can back, man. You say, well, he's a Southern Baptist. His doctrine is messed up, and he's this and that and the other. If you had cerebral palsy, would you be preaching? Would you be trying to sing victory in Jesus? That fellow's name is David Ring. I was over there at my dad's house, and I walk in one day. I'd gone by to get a sandwich. I was on duty, and I slipped by over at the house there and see my mom and dad for a minute. And mom made great sandwiches and stuff in those days. I went by there and have a sandwich with my dad, and I walk in, and that fellow's sitting in my dad's living room and pouring out his heart, man. I mean, having some issues and things going on. He was scared to death his kids were going to grow up because he thought it was hereditary. And he was scared he was going to pass it on to his kids if he had kids. And my dad's running through passages with him and trying to help him and trying to comfort him and stuff like that. My dad knew all kind of people like that. You'd never know we knew him. I mean, all kind of people. When he died, we had all kind of who's who calling all over the place. I'm answering the phone, and I'm, I'm like, Mom, that's so-and-so. And she goes, yeah. I said, Mom, Dad never told me you all knew this. She goes, well, you know your daddy. He just never really said much about it. I said, you mean you all knew them? Yeah, we knew them. Like, what's the big deal, you know? And so I'm sitting over there, and I'm watching my dad help this guy. And it got to the point I was like, dad said, come on in. And he said, it's okay, I can talk later. You know, he's all twisted up, man. I said, no, 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 I got to go back to work, man. I'm getting a call. I lied. I'm getting a call. I got to go, you know. And so I, I hauled out of there, man. I was uncomfortable, you know, because my dad trying to help the guy. And then the guy's in the pulpit. And he's preaching and singing victory in Jesus. You say, what is that? A broken box. People get all worried a lot of times about every kind of thing being passed on in the world. Is it hereditary? Is it hereditary? This happened, this happened, this happened, this happened in so-and-so's life. Is it going to happen in my life? Well, if you keep practicing the same things they did, it can happen. doesn't mean it's hereditary. It's a practiced behavior. You keep practicing the same behaviors that people did that. They say, well, heart disease is nece always necessarily uh, hereditary. Not always, but if you keep eating the same stuff they did... <laughs> You're going to wind up with the same heart disease. You may have the proclivity for that, but you can't, you can't feed that proclivity. Maybe you can dodge the proverbial bullets. Making sense to you? Can I ask you a question tonight? When's the last time you considered whether or not your heart was broken or whether or not your box is broken? I remember an old fellow up, in, uh, up at Jim Lentz's church. He was back years and years and years ago. His name was Beaver. Beaver, that was his God-given name on his birth certificate. B-E-V-E-R, not even the right way to spell it. That was his name. He was an old man. He used to run white liquor. That, For those of you who don't know, that's called moonshine. You get moonshine out, that moonshine's clearer than water is. They put it in mason jars. You shake that jar real hard, and, and it gets what they call frog eyes. If it's 100 proof or whatever, you can tell by the size of the frog eyes. I, I mean, I know about it. I've never revived in it. I'm talking about it like I made it, but... But anyway, I grew up in Tennessee where they had stills and different things like that to make it from corn squeezing and they make it from fruit and different things like that and ferment it and that kind of a deal. And then they put it in gallon jugs. You may not know, but the stock car circuit started with white liquor runners. What they did was they'd run white liquor from up there in the mountains and run it down. And the reason they beat their cars up is when the police would get after them. That's how you say it, police. You don't say police. It's not P-A-L-I. It's police. But anyway, when the police would get after them, they'd outrun them. That's one of the things they did. And then the feds would come in and they started taxing it and the revenuers and all the other kind of stuff like that. Well, Beaver used to run liquor for him. And he'd go up there and he'd get his, however much his amount was, and sometimes a couple of gallons, sometimes four or five gallons or whatever. And he'd walk them out by the tree. And he had a New Testament somebody had given him. And he'd get about halfway out of the woods. He'd sit down there by a stump, he said. And he'd get to reading that New Testament. And then he'd go put his liquor in his car and he'd run the liquor for all over there. Uncle Bud's Remedy and whoever needed what for whatever it may have been and, and those kind of things. And, and then one day he's sitting there reading and he said right there by that log, he said he realized he was lost and he was going to hell. 
And he said he got down there by that log and he asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save him. And he said, and I walked off and I left my liquor right there by the log. Beaver would get up and Brother Lentz would say, Brother Beaver, come sing for us, you know. And he'd get up and he'd get his old Gibson guitar and he'd start singing, I got so much to thank him for. And he'd get going like that and he'd get crying. He was an old-fashioned exhorter. He'd probably scare some of y'all to death. He'd get crying and he'd get to thanking God for everything. And he'd walk over. I don't know wherever why he did it. I'd ask Jim. Jim said, I don't know. He'd walk over and he'd touch the wall like that. And then he'd turn around and walk over to the other side and he'd touch the wall like that and be singing the whole time. And boy, God would just sort of come down there and fill that place up like just a presence. It gets so heavy in there sometimes you'd think you'd have to have a C&I dog to get out. Just, it'd just get cloudy. Not literally, but just you could sense God's presence in there. Beaver would go over there and go to them old stands and stuff where he used to go by when he was walking old deer stands and all. He'd crawl up in those stands and he'd tack scripture verses up there where those deer hunters would go. <laughs> he went into Walmarts one time. Oh, I'm in Carolina, so you've got to say it the way they do. <laughs> He went up to Walmart's, and what he did was is the preacher got a phone call. They said, uh, you Jim Lentz? And he said, yes, I am. You Bridgeport Baptist Church? Yes, I am. He said, well, uh, you got your tracks down here and all these shoes. People are getting their shoes and coming up here and saying, hey, how come these tracks are in here? I don't want this track and all that. You have to stop doing that. And Jim said, I'm not doing that. We haven't been doing that. And then he thought for a minute. He picked up the phone. He called Beaver. Beaver said, uh, well, preacher, you know, I was just down there shopping a little bit, and I, you know, kind of. Yeah, I kind of slipped it in one or two. Beaver, one or two, you put it in the entire men's shoe department. <laughs> he said, you got to stop that, you know, Beaver. And Beaver was known for doing that kind of stuff. You say, well, what is that? Broken box. Broken box. I was reading a story the other day about this uh, uh, general in the Civil War. And he was an old cavalry officer and came time for the war to be over with and all that stuff. I'm not here to refight all that junk. Come time to the end of that thing. And they were getting rid of all of the old cavalry horses. And those old cavalry horses were all cut up and slashed up. And some of them had just one eye left. And they'd had saber marks all over them and bullet holes in them. And some of them still had the bullets in them. And, you know, they're blind in one eye and can't see out of the other and limping along and barely able to make it. But they'd been carrying all these cavalry officers for during those uh, Civil War battles and stuff like that. And it just broke his heart to think about those horses just being shot, you know, and been put out, you know, and, and that kind of thing. So he went and bought him a whole bunch of acreage out there, and he got him a big, huge uh, pasture, big corral and stuff, and he bought as many of those horses as he could get. And he took those old war horses, and he turned them out there in the passage, uh, pasture. He didn't have anything he could do except just feed them and try to care for them and stuff. And the story is told that he sat there on his porch one day, that big old ponderosa looking type thing. He's got a big old porch out there overlooking the pasture. He liked to look there over there and watch the horses out there in the field. And the big old black clouds would begin to build up and the storm would begin to roll in. And the thunder would begin to sound like cannon off in the distance and stuff. And he said it'd sound just like the artillery barrage, the enemy that was sending in the artillery before we in the grape clusters would explode and the cannonballs would explode and he said all of a sudden he said you see the horses they'd be down eating and they'd pick that head up and they'd get up and they'd kind of smell the air you know and he said one at a time those horses on their own nobody doing anything they'd start coming to the center of the passage of the pasture and he said they'd line up across that pasture like that and they'd face that storm and they'd look at that storm and he said in a perfect line they'd begin to walk toward that storm Broken, beat, banged up, put out the pasture, good for nothing. But when they heard the sound of battle, they said, maybe just one more. Maybe just one more. You say, well, preacher, I'm too broke up. I'm too old. I'm too messed up. I, there ain't much I can do anymore. Really? Well, all Mary did was what she could. She just took a box and broke it. And the Lord made a memorial to her. Not because of the value of her gift, but because of what that gift represented. You know what that gift said? Lord, whatever I got, you can have it. Now, you want to have some success in the Christian life? That's how you do it. Sometimes it means you just give an old preacher just a couple of books. Say, maybe it'll encourage you a little bit. Maybe you can get something out of it. Sometimes you make a meal. Sometimes you just get a pound of cheese or whatever and put it in a sack and here you go, preacher. You say, well, what's the big deal? What you can't.
makes a difference. You throw a little bit in the plate and take care of a nice hotel. Allow me the privilege of coming down here to, she said, what have I got? I got a war horse at the house. She's by herself right now. She'd like to be here. And she says, go on, honey, I'll be here when you get back. You say, what is that? It's no big deal. It's what she can. She's just doing what she can. Could you consider this? Could you consider whether or not maybe, maybe you think too hard and harshly of yourself and you think you're not worth anything? And maybe I've given you enough illustrations now to tell you that the Lord will recycle you if you let him. But then can I challenge you Christians a little bit that maybe you're trying to always wait to do the big thing and the Lord really just likes the little things. Can you just do what you can do? Can't read 10 chapters today? Okay, can you read two verses? Can you just do what you can? I got an old woman back home. I hope to God she's not watching, but she's old. She's in her mid-80s now, and she's been really struggling with this COVID thing. She used to get under such conviction because she couldn't be at church every time the doors were open. I mean, it would just eat her alive. She just thought she was just as wicked and backslid as anybody in the world. And she finally began to get victory over that and come when she could because she's got all kind of aches and pains and things that hurt and bother and this and that and the other. And one of the things she had said the other day when she was going through it, she said, Preacher, I'm so weak I can't even pray. You say, what did she do? Well, just what she could. Pray for me, preacher. I can't even pray for you. She's an old prayer warrior. You won't know where you get to glory. She's kind of getting back on her feet now. You know what she'll say? I know you're away preaching. She texts me. She's old. It's a miracle. She knows how to use that phone. She'll send me a text. She'll go, I'm praying for you, preacher. I'm praying for you. You say, what does that mean? Oh, well, man, you kidding me? Boy, I'm going to tell you what, I feel like all of a sudden Aaron comes and grabs one arm. I feel her comes and grabs another arm, and I'm ready to go charge hell with a squirt gun. You say, surely that stuff doesn't make a difference. Yeah, it does. It's just a little thing, though. Just a little note. Some kid wrote a note the other day, drew a picture of a penguin on the picture of the thing. Um, Then on the back side of that, wrote him there, I love you, preacher, I'm praying for you. The penguin is you. I'm like, (laughs) I'm a peacock. Well, what are you saying? Well, you say, that's on my desk. You say, what what else can a kid do? Just what they can. The issue becomes not doing big things. It's just consistently doing little things. The things that nobody else sees. I guarantee you when she went in that room that day, she never thought there'd be scripture about her. I guarantee you she didn't do it for that reason. She did it to wrought a good work on him. But last but not least, and I'm done for tonight, you've got to recognize she also had enough sense to know she only had a short time to do it. She acted when God said it's time to act. She didn't wait. She went in there in spite of all the opposition that was there. You know what she said? I'm going right now. I like the story of the prodigal when he gets ready to come home. You know what the Bible says? The Bible said he made the hardest, longest trip he could ever make. You say to the far country, no. You say back to the father's house, no. The hardest trip that boy had to make was the trip from his head to his heart. The Bible said and when he came to himself. He said, you know something? There's servants in my daddy's house. And they have bread enough to eat. And I'm not even worthy to be called a son and I've taken advantage of that. I will arise and I will go to my father's house. That trip he made was a hard, long journey. It was about 14 inches. And he had a hard time with that go from right here to right here. And you know what he did? He got up out of that pig pen and he said, I'm going to the house. Now, what's he going to do after that? What he can. What does he do after that? Everybody wants to know. What he can. He certain things he loses. What are you so worried about that? It doesn't matter. The father's happy. Can I just encourage you tonight to maybe just get back to doing what you can? Don't let the devil weigh you down and make you think you're not doing enough or not think you're worthy enough to do anything. <laughs> Have you ever looked? You know what my calling is in the Bible? I'm the least of everything. You say, why? The Lord says, I'll choose the base things. 
okay? Nothing special about me. The only thing you might find about me is, is that when he called, I picked up the phone. That's all there is to it. The rest of it's him. Father, I pray you bless your word tonight. I pray, Lord, you'll help these folks to understand.